Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, what an uh, awesome film. So exciting to see that with you. I had forgotten um, seeing it now many years ago, all the music that was in it and all the singing by Bayard. Um, so I'm super pleased to introduce our guest panelists for the evening um, to just give some responses and, uh, and then we'll have, I think, plenty of time to have a conversation. Um, so uh, the to my left, you know from the film, I believe, um, is uh, Walter uh, Walter Nagel, um, uh, Bard Rustin's surviving partner. Um, and uh, who's an artist himself and a photographer and also the executor of Bayard Rustin's estate um, and, uh, and an author and a number of other things. So really uh, thrilled and a Chelsea resident. So <laughs> thrilled to have him with us. And, uh, and then to my right is um, Norman Hill. Um, and I'm just gonna read Norman Hill's uh, uh, accomplishments because there are many of them and I don't wanna forget anything. Um, also a Chelsea resident. Um, but he was the National Program Director of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE. Um, he was the staff coordinator for the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Um, he was staff representative for the Industrial Union Department of the AFL-CIO and the president of the A. Philip Randolph Institute from 1980 to 2004, the longest tenure in the organization's history. He remains its um, uh, president emeritus and uh, is the recent author of a joint memoir with his wife, who could not be with us um, tonight, uh, but who that I think he'll talk some more about, um, Climbing the rough, rough Side of the Mountain, that just came out about their uh, uh, time in the movement together. So um, I'm then going to hand the mic to people who can say more than I can. Maybe if you guys want to offer some brief comments and reflections, and we can open it up. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Um, Recognizing from the film, well, I'm not so sure about that. That was, the, we're at the 21st anniversary of this film, so the recording, the interviews were done in the 90, 1999, 2000, 2001. I had more hair then, and it was, it was brown. So if you did recognize me, it's, it's, it's quite all right. Um, this has been a really good year for Bard, obviously the last, you know, the last year. Um, partly because of the release of the Netflix film, Rustin, which was produced by uh, President Obama and his wife uh, and their higher ground company. Um, but also there were several other things that, that happened. Um, in August, the headquarters of the March on Washington up on 130th Street, there was a plaque unveiled to commemorate the uh, anniversary, the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington in August. Um, and just a few weeks ago, there was supposed to be a premiere of a musical oratorio called Rustin in Renaissance at Jazz and Lincoln Center. Unfortunately, the composer's father died about 10 days before the premiere, so it was postponed until October. But if you keep your eyes open for that, it's something that we'll be playing uh, at Jazz and Lincoln Center. Now, with that cyber, um, when Bennett Singer realized that the Netflix film was going to be opening up. He got on the phone to the Netflix people and said, you know, we have this great documentary um, from 2003, and you know, you should really put this up as a companion piece to the Netflix film. And you know, there was some negotiation back and forth and discussion about it. But it worked out, so it is currently streaming on Netflix if you want to watch it again or if you want to kind of spread the word. I think it's important because those of you who have seen Rustin with an uh, award-winning performance by Coleman Domingo, um, but that really focused on the March on Washington, the organization of the March on Washington, whereas this film really gives you a, a broader view of Bard's whole life and the philosophy that led him to do the various kinds of activities that he, that he did. So I think it's, you know, it's kind of good to view the two films. Uh, some of you may have seen an article in the Times a few weeks ago. It was on the subject of biopics. Um, and I think I, I was one of the first lines in, in the story. And when the guys first came to me in 2010 about doing a film about Bard, I said, you know, what do I need you guys for? We have this wonderful documentary. And they convinced me that, well, yeah, you have a great documentary, but how many people have seen it? 
Uh, no matter how good it is, it has a much more limited audience. Whereas if you have a film that drops on Netflix on November 17th, 2023, and it's immediately streamed into 174 countries around the world, the recognition and the lifting up of Bayard's name is just incredibly um, heightened. So as I said, you know, people can see that film and if they want to learn more, they can go back to the documentary. There are a number of biographies out about Bayard. Uh, Norm's book I know includes quite a bit about his work, his and Velma Hill's work with Bayard. So there's a lot of resources out there. But just getting Bayard's name into the public was a tremendous achievement, I think. And so I'm grateful to President Mrs. Obama. I would like to try to add a dimension to what was a brilliant and effective film, Brother Outsider. Byron had a philosophical, political, and organizational relationship with A. Philip Randolph, this nation's greatest black labor leader. They shared a philosophy that went something like this. Salvation for a race, nation, or class must come from within. Freedom is never granted, it is won. Justice is never given, it is exacted. Freedom and justice must be struggled for by the oppressed of all lands and races. And the struggle must be continuous, for freedom is never a final fact but a continually evolving process to higher and higher levels of human, social, economic, political, and religious relationships. In their campaigns, civil rights-wise, A. Philip Randolph and Bide Rustin were guided by five operating principles. First, they were committed to a society in which racial equality and economic justice would prevail. They believed that blacks could make the most progress by simultaneously confronting the barriers of race and class. Second, in the pursuit of racial equality and economic justice, they adopted a majoritarian strategy involving coalition politics. They believed that blacks ought to aggressively and militantly pursue racial equality and economic justice, but that they ought to do so given the fact that they're a numerical and racial minority in such a way as to maximize friends and minimize enemies, to generate majority support. For them, the essence, the core of the coalition was an alliance between the trade union movement and the civil rights movement, between organized labor and the black community. A. Philip Randolph put it this way in his day, comparatively speaking, there are pitifully few blacks who are millionaires, not very many more blacks who own or run or manage large corporations or businesses. Blacks, if they're employed, are employed essentially as workers, working for somebody, someone, some firm, some company, some organization, some institution. And being the most historically exploited of workers, they had a direct bread, <coughs> bread and butter economic relationship with that movement that's about improving the lives of working people, namely the trade union movement. Third, they were committed <coughs> to self-liberation. By that, they meant that any group that is mistreated, that is oppressed, experiences unfairness, that is treated unjustly, should take the initiative to challenge the unfair and unjust status quo in which they find themselves. In short, they said, if you don't fight for yourselves, who will? Fourth. They were committed to mass action. By that they meant the march, the picket line, the boycott, some means by which those who had the problem, regardless of how much money they had, no matter what their educational level or their economic and social status, could with their allies challenge key decision makers. And finally, 
they were committed to nonviolence. For that, they did not mean passive non-resistance, but the use of nonviolence is an integral part of direct mass action. It is in this context that I suggest that we remember Brian Rustin as a master strategist and tactician of the movement and an outstanding civil rights leader. Thank you. Norman, did you want to invite Louise to read a little bit? Uh, my wife, Velma, my love, friend, partner and comrade, and I have written a memoir entitled Climbing the Rust Side of the Mountain, an extraordinary story of over six decades of life, love, civil rights, and labor activism with an introduction co-authored by the late, great civil rights icon and con congressional leader, John Lewis, and the late Vernon Jordan, former president of the National Urban League, director of the Voter Education Project of the Southern Regional Council, and leader of the United Negro College Fund. The memoir chronicles our experiences and activities that led to our being the only black couple uh, to hold leadership positions in both the trade union and civil rights movements. The memoir is on sale for $35. You can pay by check, credit card, or cash. Checks should be made out to Hill, Murphy Hill Partners Incorporated. I would like now to sort of conclude my remarks about, about our memoir by introducing our publicist who will read an excerpt from the memoir, Louise Crawford. Soil of generations 
that it reaps so many of its benefits. Our story of the movement is one that, of course, looks back, but it also looks forward and is populated with consequences and demands that are as contemporary as the moment you read these words. Thank you. I conclude by suggesting and encouraging you at the end of this event to purchase the Climbing the Rough Side of the Mountain, which is displayed at the table on my left. Uh, by, with, and through Climbing the Rough Side of the Mountain, we carry forward the legacy of A. Philip Randolph, this nation's greatest black labor leader, the founder of the most historically significant union for black workers and brotherhood of seeping our porters, who served passengers who rode along distance overnight trains, the father of the modern civil rights movement, and by Rustin, Randolph's most outstanding colleague, a civil rights leader in his own right, who wrestled over 20 times in the struggle for civil rights, a master strategist and tactician of the movement, carrying forward the struggle for racial equality and economic justice. Thank you. So now we have some time for discussion. So um, <coughs> anything in the film, anything you want to ask our distinguished guests, uh, please feel free. Um, I see in the front. I just want to say thank you to his partner, because I know it wasn't easy during that time. And I want to tell you that the, the queer community is very proud of you and Rustin, because I know that must have been some tough times. But I want to tell you, some of us don't make it to the big screen. I was in the movement with Carl Bean during the time that they had the churches because they were bashing people that um, was gay and lesbian. And I know that just being his partner, taking a stand during that time was so powerful for you as well as him. And I'm just glad that I was at Target early. I was so many different places, but I had to make it here. And I'm so glad that you're here, that I can see you. And I did buy the book. I wanted the book as soon as I saw it. And I want both of you gentlemen to sign it. But I'm just so excited about you, believe me. So when I get a chance to go back to the center, I can tell them that I saw you in person. I've been trying to see the movie, but I had to go to Florida. So I didn't get a chance. And then they had a storm, and they canceled us at the other place. Then they said they have it. It took so much to get here. But I want to say thank you for being such an awesome person that you are, because that took a lot of strength during that time to even be his partner. Because when you're sharing life with someone like that, you're a powerful person too, because I know it took a lot to be who you were back then. So I thank you, and the queer community thanks you. Thank you, Ms. It's very nice and more than generous. Um, remember, it, it is Florida. So if you can see that film or this film or even get some books now, it's, you know, you're way ahead of the game. I think I was very lucky to be part of Byron's life. I mean, he was somebody that I had learned about when I was in eighth grade, the summer of the March on Washington. Um, and, you know, just, I was very interested in the movement, and I was interested in the whole concept of nonviolence. I was kind of this religious, nerdy kid. Uh, and Bard's name was always popping up, and so it was like, gee, this is a, a guy I should get to know something about. So I was very fortunate to be part of his life. But I also, you know, I, I think it's fair to say, look, we lived in New York, and we didn't have it nearly as tough as people in the Midwest, and certainly people in the South, gay couples, uh, uh, have it. So, um, you know, it wasn't always easy, but we had it a lot easier than people in other parts of the country. But thank you for your kind of contribution. And just, Walter, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about, um, because obviously there was no gay marriage at that point, um, but you were in a legal partnership. So I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that kind of interesting aspect of your story. Uh, yeah, actually, um, something that was not touched on in this film, but there is a short doc called Byron and Me. I think it's about 18 minutes long, which you could probably see online, um, which deals with the subject that Byron legally adopted me. 
in 1982. Um, we had been by that, that time we'd been together four to five years, and we thought about you know well Byron was 37 years older than me, and the likelihood was that I was going to outlive him, um, and so we were trying to find a legal way of uh, codifying or legalizing our relationship, and we talked to a lawyer about it, and he thought it was kind of an intriguing idea. Uh, and we went through the process in New York State, which involved having a social worker come into the home to determine if it was a fit home for a 32-year-old adopted child. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was a little, uh, she was a little flummoxed when she, walked, when she walked in. It's like, oh. But, you know, I think she figured out what was happening. And I think that, uh, she wanted to be sure that uh, this was not some older man taking advantage of this young kid, and also some young kid taking advantage of an older man. And I think, uh, you know, she figured that after that was not the case, and she recommended the adoption, and it, it went through. So we were fortunate that we were able to have a legal relationship. Comments, questions? Go ahead. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, Norman, about the role of sort of the idea of democracy in the movement. For Bayer, democracy was a way of life. There, he chose democratic ends, means to achieve democratic ends. And I think that uh, what we need today is more Bayer Russians in the in the in the context of today's political climate in which there is a right-wing threat to turn the clock back and, and, and reverse the progress that we have made on rights. So I, I th think that Biden was in fact a true Democrat, small d. Did I see someone on this side of the room? I thought I did, but I may have been. You know, my students know well that if you're scratching your head, it means I think you have something to say. So, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. I just wanted you to mention a little bit about the medal. It's an eventual medal. I mean, it is not for the film, but I know about that. So I thought maybe you could mention it, but how that happened. So I don't remember the details. Thank you. This is one of our neighbors over in Penn South. Um, 2013, I got a call from um, one of President Obama's assistants saying that they uh, wanted to award Bayard a Medal of Freedom uh, in November of that year, and would I come down and accept it? Um, it was exciting, it was thrilling, um, and more importantly, it was, well, it was the fifth, then it was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, and Bayard was really the only person in the leadership role of the march who had not been given a Medal of Freedom. Everybody else, Mr. Randolph, Dr. King, Jim Farmer, Roy Wilkins, they had all received the Medal of Freedom uh, during their lifetime except for Dr. King's, which was given posthumously. And this was kind of a way of bringing Byron in from the shadows where he had been so often relegated during his lifetime. And to, you know, kind of lift him up on the 50th anniversary of the march. And so I went down to the White House and accepted the medal. Uh, it was significant in another way I was uh, one of first two LGBT partners to accept the medal. Uh, Sally Wright's partner was there the same day. Um, and since we were arranged alphabetically on the platform, Wright comes just before wrestling. So even though we were next to each other, she was actually the first to accept it. But it, 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 was, it was just, it was a good time. It was a fun time. There were other people there that day, Gloria Steinem, 
uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian, who was a, an important part of the movement in the South, um, who also got the medal that day. So it was really, it was really just a, a wonderful, wonderful time. And actually, because you mentioned um, that she's a neighbor, I don't know if either of you wants to talk a little bit about how you both come to be Chelsea residents, because I think it's a fascinating uh, aspect of the story, too, and about the value of uh, a kind of housing that we have too little of in New York City right now. Well, we live in Penn South, a cooperative that is a kind of rare, th rare model or replica of in, in today's society. I remember that uh, when Velma and I moved uh, to New York from Washington, D.C. in 1967, uh, Bayard used his relationship with the labor leadership that had sponsored and played a major role in building Penn South to help us get into the co-op, which we did. And then we have been residents of the co-op ever since and continue to be a, 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 a direct part of Chelsea. Yeah, and I, I was able to inherit Byron's apartment because I was literally his child. So, um, uh, yeah, otherwise I would not have been able to have stayed there. And, you know, Penn South is quite a progressive community, and I think they always like to be sort of on the cutting edge of change. And so even though we're talking 1987, long before the idea of gay marriage, um, you know, they recognized that we were a serious couple, and, uh, of course, Byron's long history in the in the movement, in the labor movement, and the civil rights movement. So I think they wanted to, you know, they wanted to make it possible. And over the course of the last, well, until uh, gay marriage was legalized, I guess it was in 2013, um, they started making exceptions for uh, long-term couples who had lived together as partners, even if they were not legally married. Yeah, I will say there's, um now, I think some legislation being considered at the New York state level to form a social housing development authority that would build more of this kind of cooperative housing, non-market housing, affordable housing, um, which I, th I think would be quite welcome. Uh, Bobian, over there. Nope, go ahead, yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Distance. Yeah. I, the nuances in which a black gay man living at that time has struggled. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I think I think what you're saying is very very true. Um, one of the things that one of the things that Bart went through during the time that I was with him, um, you know, the whole issue of AIDS started developing, and. You know, he went to the black leadership and said, you know, this is something we really have to, to deal with. So even though at that time it was largely considered a white gay man's disease, it was a disease. And diseases don't discriminate. And Byron understood that, you know, the nature of a disease is that gradually it works its way down to the poorest in the community. And to the degree that black people were disproportionately poor, and still are, Things are better, but back then it was worse. Uh, eventually, they will be facing this crisis, and so he wanted. To, and one of the you know the responses was, you know, we don't we have bad education, bad health care, terrible housing. Do we have to take this on too? Why do we have to take this on? You know, that was the kind of attitude that I think Bard Bard faced. What um, what the strength that he had really came from his quicker quicker upbringing. He was taught to be 
honest, to be truthful, to speak truth to power, if you will, uh, to be to be himself. And so he never really tried to hide it. And when he was talking to gay groups uh, a couple of years before he died, he was meeting and talking to people. You know, he would say the most important thing the community can do is to be open and come out and let people know that you know we're not the monsters that. Uh, uh, the right wing tries to portray us that we are. We're just ordinary folks like anybody else, your aunts, your uncles, your brothers, your sisters, teachers, you know, and all of that. And so I think that was really, and as Norman said in his remarks, that, you know, the whole idea was if you don't really stand up and fight for your own rights, you can't expect other people to, to join in and do that. So, you know, the nuances are still here. It's not as free as we would like it to be, and there are still a lot of young uh, black men who struggle with, you know, prejudice in, in, in their own community and in the church. But it's certainly, certainly better than it was. I uh, was interested uh, that uh, Norman's uh, rec uh, recollections and analysis still hues so closely to the division between um, organizing people on self-interest and shared self-interest, like, uh, is portrayed in the film, um, and the co competition uh, of nationalism, like represented uh, by uh, Byron's debates with Malcolm X and uh, Stoke and Carmichael. So I, I'm wondering, like in light of the president, when it seems like nationalism uh, and uh, even kind of irrational nationalism like that seems to be really powerful politically, uh, how, how do we see the balance of power between uh, organizing people on our shared self-interests uh, versus um, uh, you know, somehow uh, contending with the, the force that nationalism might continue to play. Well, I think that, uh, I think that the organizing around self-interest can, can be a powerful, motivating uh, tool or force, in that, uh, uh, in a sense, the civil rights movement, which, the, which, <clears throat> which uh, and its allies, were, were were a force against nationalism, and a force for the for opening up society. Uh, for all to participate. So I think that the, uh, uh, I think the civil rights movement is a powerful example of organizing around self-interest and in fact, cutting off or com competing against the uh, it's sort of narrow self uh, defeating force of that nationalism. We could definitely use some of that. Um, I, I actually, in the film, they didn't talk that much about the um, the freedom budget as a project of um, by Rustin and and yourself. I think at the A. Philip Randolph Institute. So I don't know if you want to talk about that at all too, as a as a way of thinking about politics in America and and how we might. Organize. Well, as the film made reference, Bayer wrote a seminal article in 1965 called From Protest to Politics, in which he was suggesting that the problems facing blacks were not merely racial but economic and social, and not just fair employment but full employment not just integrated housing, but quality affordable housing. Not, not just integrated education, but education that maximizes the learning potential of all, particularly minorities. And that these problems could not be addressed effectively by, by a single demonstration. They might highlight the, the inequity, but that they required a major allocation of resources. And that was and that was dependent on the response 
of elected officials, especially the presidency and the Congress, and that uh, in so doing, uh, Byard and Randolph developed with the major economist Leon Kaiserling the Freedom Budget for All Americans, in which uh, a budget was put forth to meet the unmet social and economic needs, not just of the blacks, but of all Americans. It, it, in fact, it, it, it attracted support from religious figures, civil rights leadership, uh, union leaders. And it, it, it uh, unfortunately did not get gained traction in the Congress uh, because we, we did not generate a mass movement that, that could, in fact, influence and guide and direct the Congress. And, and plus, in, in its infancy, it's, the Freedom Budget got caught up in the, the, in the debate and, dis, and discussion and controversy around the Vietnam War and the guns versus butter argument. Whereas uh, the Freedom Budget was definitely a commitment to butter and, and, and the eradication of poverty is is Byard indicated in Brother Outsider. Chantel? Hi, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I wanted to comment how this, uh, this documentary really emotionally resonated with me um, in terms of like, um, um, in uh, especially, and I can imagine it also did too for a lot of student activists, um, and uh, in a way almost like um, echoes our like current time. It was just really like um, inspirational to see someone who uh, really sucks with the believe in, even from a very young age. I think I heard like you know like um, actions being done while they're in their twenties, and I'm like, oh my god, I just entered my twenties. It feels like this is a very like call to action sort of thing. Um, what I thought was really interesting that to think about was how a lot of what was happening kind of like echoes our current modern day situation and modern day politics to show there was a lot of things to still be thought for. But what's really interesting is that nowadays there's been a lot of pathways to create to do that kind of bureaucratic or to like have partners be able to uh, do that and like what the documentary was talking about, end up negotiating and compromising instead of like demanding everything that they're looking for. So it really like makes me like consider, you know, like do we um, fight these like bureaucracies that make things slow, that make us negotiate, or do we like work with them to use that platform? So yeah, it was like really inspiring to see a man who managed to and do both of those things, but like no matter what, we're operating, we both function as doing what we believe in. Yeah, yeah, well, oh, go ahead, Polina. Um, I don't really know what kind of question this is, but what really touched me during this documentary was this arrest because of the sexual perversion, where uh, Rushkin seemed to just like kind of lose hope for a while um, because he was fighting obviously for the laws that he believed were just that might not have been the laws of the land, but that seemed to me kind of like a really bitter realization that like maybe the world just isn't ready right now um, for I guess what I want to do and I. 
And I think since then, maybe that sort of led to this mindset of kind of like compromise and more of a reasonable approach. Um, or maybe that was just growing up and maturing. I don't know. I, I just, I was really interested in this sort of breakthrough moment. Well, I think it was, um, you know, if you look at it in the context of the time, so you're talking 1953, you're in the midst of the McCarthy era, McCarthy era, which, you know, everybody always thinks about, you know, McCarthy was all about the communists. Well, it was also about the homosexuals, and especially about the homosexual communists. But actually, <laughs> God forbid. Um, and of course, this is, you know, 16 years before Stonewall. So, um, you know, it was something that, that, that Art struggled with, I think. Um, you know, he was out, he was open, he didn't try to hide it, but he did, you know, he struggled with um, people in the movement who, I mean, he, the, the, the group he was working for at that time was a, a, a Christian pacifist organization. It's now interdenominational, it's still around Fellowship Reconciliation. But it was really, uh, I mean, politically radical, but culturally very conservative in terms of religious values and religious wars. And so they just really found it difficult to tolerate Byron's uh, acting out, at least publicly. Now, you know, look, I'm not going to say, you know, I think Byron made a mistake um, getting arrested publicly. Uh, however, at the same time, again, this was 1953, and it was not just gay people who were having sex in cars, folks. It was illegal for uh, straight people to be having sex in a lot of places outside of marriage. And so, you know, I, I don't think many people in this audience, because you're so young, but I can tell you there were quite a few people of my generation who were, who were conceived in the back seats of cars. So I think the, the thing was, when, you know, when the straight folks got arrested, they got a slap on their wrist and told to go home to their parents. When the gay folks got arrested, they got 60 or 90 days in jail. So, you know, it was this double standard we, we were dealing with. And it haunted him for, like, the rest of his life, which I found so terrible. Like, this mistake that you make in your young age, basically you have to regret it and think about it for the rest of your career. Yeah, well, it was true until uh, Mr. Randolph had the backbone to stand up in 1963 and unite the civil rights leadership, not all of whom were happy. Uh, if, and if you saw the Rustin film, particularly Mr. Wilkins, not because he didn't like Bard, but he just knew that this was the kind of thing that was going to be brought up again, as it was by Strom Thurmond on the Senate floor. So, you know, it was risky. But because Mr. Randolph really stood up at that time, it pretty much put an end to that kind of, that kind of thing. I think Randolph demonstrated... Uh, not only his integrity, but his commitment to, 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 to Byron when he, he called the press conference after Strom Thurmond's attack on Byron, indicating that he had complete confidence in Byron, that Byron would continue as the chief organizer of the march. And I think that that, 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 that that helps solidify Byard's role as, as, as the great organizer of the march. Yeah, and I think, you know, one other thing I think comes out in the film so well, and Norman, you're so well placed, I think, to talk about is how much the march, how, how the historical memory of the march is in part sometimes limited. I mean, I think sometimes it's quite shocking for people that it was called the March for Jobs and Freedom and the economic aspect and how many trade union buses came to the march. And, you know, so the, the ambition of the march, its size, and also its um, ambition to unite economic and racial justice, civil rights demands, um, I think is really one aspect of that history that's so important to remember. I would very much agree. The march uh, was very much a coalition of civil rights, labor, and uh, progressive churches. And I think that the, uh, the, uh, the march helped to create the political climate 
that led to the Magna Carta legislatively of the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, so that the, uh, the march, which, 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 is the, which was and is the largest civil rights demonstration in U.S. history, uh, is a historic and noteworthy event. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question, if anyone has one. Oh, I'm not seeing. Who is who is being pointed to? Whoever's being pointed to, please speak, because <laughs> I'm not seeing you from here. No, there are two people. All right, I'll go. Please. The overall character trait that I see in Bayard throughout the film is just this complete selflessness, there's, and also this total control over public appearance, you know, there's this, you know, he's a public figure, so he needs to control his appearance and suppress a lot of things, you know, a lot of things, even just the whole non-violent aspect of his, his protesting, that requires you to suppress your urges to, you know, you know, to, you know get violent, and I guess, especially with the whole having to suppress your homosexuality, um, how do you ride that line? You know, as, did he ever speak to you about riding that line between, you know, these acts of selflessness, but also taking care of yourself? Because so much of his career, or, you know, so much of his life seems to be directed toward this career for fighting for equality, but where does he ride that line to also take care of himself? Well, I think because because of the way he was raised, the philosophy that was you know given to him as a child, um, he just by living living out his ideals and living out his philosophy, he was taking care of himself. He was fulfilling who he was destined to be, if you will. Um, I think that uh, he was a person of tremendous courage. Um, when I was younger, you know, I would read about some of these things that he, he did and the arrests and the beatings and the jailings and, you know, well, you know, I grew up at a time when there were quite a few young people doing that in the South and doing that in Mississippi and Alabama. But Byron did it consistently over a, a long period of time. And um, now that I'm older, I kind of wonder how the hell... How did he do that? I mean, how was he able to, to do that and really maintain a, a nonviolent stance in a position which he, which he did? And uh, again, it largely, it largely goes back to his, his religious upbringing. I mean, he was, when he started out in the movement, he was deeply religious. To go back and look at his early writings and the speeches that he gave, he was speaking in churches. You know, it was all about being... A, Christian, a good Christian and following Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount about loving your neighbor, loving your enemies. Um, over time, he evolved. Um, not because he walked away from that, but because I think he realized that if you're going to be active politically and you need to be, build a coalition, you, you, know, you need to broaden your appeal. Um, and, you know, the, the basis for most organized religions, if you will, um, you know, has has to do with, with, with the family of, of man, the family of people, um, and you know, not killing and, and you know, being kind and being generous. And you know, we moved away from a lot of that over the years. But uh, my point is that he could he could still appeal to a broad range of people with that message without necessarily constantly referring to Christ, if you will, because it was a, it was really a universal message. So it was something he kept with him through his life. Do you want to say anything by way of closing, Norman? No, I just would suggest that, that uh, you use this opportunity to buy a, to buy a memoir at $35 a copy. <laughs> it, it carries forward the legacy of Bayard Rustin. And I think it's a, a valuable contribution 
not just in civil rights history, but uh, has lessons for the, for the day's movement as, as it current, uh, fights its current challenges. Yeah, and we certainly have no uh, shortage of fights for peace, for racial justice, for economic justice, for democracy uh, in front of us. Um, so I just want to say thank you to our guests for the evening. Um, thank you to you all for coming. Um, thank you to the folks in the booth for making the visuals work. Thank you to Brenda for all her help organizing. Um, please buy the memoir and uh, have a really good night. <laughs>